Marsupial Robots with Robohub, the podcast for news and views on robotics. Hello and welcome to the Robohub podcast. In today's episode, we will hear about marsupial robots. A phrase coined in the late 1990s, marsupial robots are pairs of robots where a larger robot carries a smaller passenger. The term marsupial actually has its origins in biology where it's used to describe animal species that carry around their young in a pouch, such as kangaroos. So the idea behind marsupial robots is that each of the two parts complements the other. The passenger robot, for instance a UAV, might be better suited for sensing and exploration, while the carrier robot might have a much longer battery life. Our interviewer Lily speaks to graduate student Chris Lee about the applications of marsupial robots and the challenge of deciding when to deploy a passenger robot during exploration. Hi, welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, Hi, Lily. Um, Thanks for having me. Um, My name is Chris Lee, uh, and I am a graduate student at OSU. Uh, I'm pursuing my master's degree in robotics, and currently my research is based on marsupial robots. Cool. And will you tell us a little bit about what marsupial robots are? Sure. Uh, So you have these complex heterogeneous robots. uh, And when I say heterogeneous, that I mean like two different types of robots. And these robot systems typically consist of a big, larger carrier robot that carries one or more smaller passenger robots. And they come from the term marsupial robots was coined by, you know, somebody back in the 90s uh, based on the fact that you've got like these koalas or kangaroos that carry little things in their pouch. So that's the idea. And are there actual pouches or do you sort of use that term to capture any sort of passenger carrier situation? Definitely the latter. Uh, I think a pouch wouldn't be too practical for this situation, but it just typically describes any robotic system that has a robot carrying another robot and that carrying can be in any kind of capacity. Okay. And with the ones that you're working on or that you have in mind, is it typically that the larger robot is kind of, I'm picturing the larger robot is driving and the smaller robots might be drones. Is that the sort of thing you work on? Yeah, that, that's, that's the classic case. Um, and most of my research is kind of oriented with that in mind. So you have um, a big, robust uh, ground vehicle, and it's carrying multiple drones. But uh, we can extend our, at least my work, to um, a big boat carrying multiple smaller AUVs or, or submarines and then deploying them as necessary. And I guess typically that's your standard most super robot is the ground robot carrying drones, but that term doesn't only specify that kind of robot. And what sorts of um, what sorts of things are the robots doing that makes it beneficial to have two different kinds? Namely, just the wide variety of capabilities. So you can imagine in our wheeled big care robot case that this care robot that's carrying all the, the smaller drones, it's, it's big, right? And so it has typically a higher payload. The sensor capabilities might be a lot better. So your LIDAR, your cameras on there could have six cameras because it has the weight capacity for that or seven or eight, whatever number you ha- that you, that you want essentially. And it has a lot of uh, power and capability, right? But it's big and clunky. So um, in a wheeled system, in this case, it can't go up and down stairs very easily. It literally can't go down air shafts. So a drone is a lot more flexible in that case, right? Um, It has that verticality that the carrier robot does not. But it has a lot lighter payload. So you may only have one or two cameras on there. And so you're kind of trying to capture the best of both worlds um, in this case. Yeah. And I imagine, um, so you mentioned power as one of the things that the larger robot has more of than sensors. So I imagine that they share information with each other. Do they, can they also share power with each other? Uh, yes. Um, there has been a, a paper or two that I've uh, kind of cited, if I remember correctly, 
um, they do talk about kind of the power distribution there. But I think that's kind of abstracted away in academia, of course. But um, in practicality, I'm sure you have to have some kind of docking system. So I think that introduces uh, another layer of complexity. We're, we're already talking about two robots, right? Like, you know how hard making one robot work already is. So when you introduce multiple robots, um, that's already pretty difficult. So um, in this case, uh, there has been, um, I guess, some systems out there that do share power because you, you can have that big robot act as a big charging station. Um, but I don't think most people consider that because that that's like a really nice to have, but not a need to have. Sure. So beyond information, what more can they share amongst themselves? Oh, right. I kind of glossed over the information part. Uh, so yes, uh, I'll kind of go back to that. Of course, they can share information um, between each other. Uh, but uh, actually, on the topic of power, um, you can have uh, these robots stay dormant until they depart. So um, that information sharing isn't uh, constant between both robots. And of course, uh, range is an issue. You mentioned that this is useful in cases where you really need varied capabilities. What are some of the applications that you're most interested in? So um, I'll kind of give an anecdote of my postdoc kind of when we were start fleshing out this problem and we were sitting in a uh, graph hall. So it's a multi-layered uh, building and we're on the first floor and he's pointing to a ledge and he's saying, okay, you know, is that a good spot for a drone to explore? Right. And so um, the, that kind of application where you want to, it, exploration is pretty much where I've centered my entire research around. Um, and it's just, I, I think the most easiest application that you can kind of think of for my research, because um, you're trying to leverage both capabilities of the robot and when you're talking about drones in this case, if you have a drone go somewhere that the ground robot can't go, then that would be the most optimal. And then you kind of have these kinds of obstacles and uh, exposures in uh, urban environments. So um, in a rural environment, like a grassland or something like that, you typically don't have these kinds of obstacle issues. Uh, in urban environments, for example, the, the DARPA project uh, they did, the urban circuit was in an abandoned nuclear power plant at Satsop, Washington, or it's called Satsop, it was in Elma, Washington. And so, you know, having that kind of uh, environment is um, the most apropos, in my opinion, for um, this research. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the, the DARPA challenge. Could you give a brief overview for anyone not familiar with it? Sure. Uh, so this is a multi-year project. And the, uh, the challenge essentially consists of, consisted of four different stages. The, the third stage got canceled because of the pandemic. But um, it essentially you have the challenge where DARPA presents a course. Uh, so the first course was a tunnel circuit. The second course was an urban circuit. Uh, the third course was supposed to be a cave circuit. And then the final course was supposed to be, it's up in the air still. And the idea is you have these artifacts that are scattered throughout the environment. So the artifacts could be a backpack, a, a survivor dummy, um, cameras, cell phones, stuff like that. And the challenge involves sending out autonomous robots into this environment uh, that we don't have any prior knowledge of and trying to identify and, and pinpoint the locations of this artifact. Mm -hmm. And you've talked, so you've mentioned a lot of the, the sort of advantages of having these marsupial carrier passenger robots. Um, what are the biggest technical challenges and what is it that your research is sort of trying to solve? Uh, definitely. Right. So, uh, there's the software and hardware side. Uh, I'll get to the hardware side a little bit after cause, um, uh, there's a lot to talk about there, I guess. Uh, but the software side, um, uh, based on my literature research, a lot of the planning and, um, 
coordination of these multi-robot systems have only involved uh, simple deployment uh, objectives. So you can imagine the case where this care robot is traveling uh, and it, it can't overcome a barrier or something like that. It literally can't. And so that makes the decision very easy to say, okay, I'm going to deploy my passenger robot and have this robot go off. In some other cases, they have the planning abstracted away where the deployment is uh, just deployed in the beginning of the mission or at the end of the mission or exactly right in the middle of the mission. And so I'm kind of harping on the deployment because that on the software side and the planning side, that that's uh, what I find most interesting and also what I think is uh, very integral. And so what I'm trying to do is kind of go in between and say, okay, given a certain amount of passenger robots, when and where as you're exploring the environment, do you want to deploy, right? And so the question um, isn't easily answered sometimes because uh, you don't know if it's better to deploy all three in the beginning or all three towards the end or somewhere in the middle. And of course, there's some Goldilocks zone uh, where it makes sense. In the case where you're, um, where you're trying to make these decisions, are you assuming that you have some knowledge of the environment or is it all happening online? Yeah, uh, excellent question. So, um, so my postdoc would put it, I'm, I'm taking just words from him in this case. Uh, if you if you have no assumptions of the environment and no prior knowledge, then your robot's just blind, just driving around doing nothing, right? So um, certainly uh, this is a hard problem and I've abstracted away some of the issues uh, like such as perception and putting that away. But uh, I am making the assumption that um, I do know some kind of underlying distribution of the features of interest in the environment that I'm trying to capture. So um, in this case, let's use the DARPA example again, where artifacts um, where we're trying to capture and I have some kind of function or distribution that's describing the environment, how these artifacts are scattered around. Um, in my research, I've specifically focused on frontier cells, uh, which is our way of kind of describing, a, a way to describe um, exploration value of a location. Um, and so I do make the assumption that I do know something about this distribution. Um, and I have shown uh, in some works that it's not such a, the, the assumption is there, but um, certain prior knowledge of other different environments that are similar uh, can be kind of used in place of this. So it's not such a bad assumption uh, because uh, urban environments can share very similar distributions of features of interest. Mm -hmm. And you, so you mentioned frontier areas as sort of a metric for exploration. Is that what you're optimizing for? Yes. So uh, again, uh, abstracting away a lot of the problem space. Um, so you can imagine uh, we're tr the ultimate question we're trying to answer is what's a good location or where's a good location for a drone to deploy? How do you quantify that? Right. And um, uh, so, so I, I'll give you the, one of the good extremes is that uh, if we could use some semantic labeling and say, okay, we know there's some stairs, there's some ledges, and we have some kind of assigned value to that. And then it makes it uh, clear that these are the features that we care about to deploy. Uh, for me, uh, again, I kind of abstracted away at, at that problem space and just said, okay, um, the number of frontier cells at each location is, um, if a location has a higher frontier cell, I'm going to make the assumption there that it is a much better deployment location than the previous location or another location that has a lot lower exploration uh, frontier cells, yeah. So uh, you're trying to decide the best place to deploy one of these um, smaller, less capable robots based on exploration potential, do you also jointly consider where they will go after that? Or is that sort of a separate problem? Yes. So uh, we're definitely getting into like, you know, future work. That is definitely a, a separate problem. So um, the, as far as I'm concerned with my research and algorithm, the the moment we kind of deploy, uh, we do assume some kind of radius that the 
this uh, passenger robot can kind of capture in terms of the information that it's sensing in the world. But um, I am not uh, definitely optimizing over its future path, right? Uh, because uh, I, I think that that's uh, certainly a very hard problem that, um, you know, other people can definitely uh, look into for sure. But um, there's a lot to go into because because you're trying to consider, I guess, you know, with your ground robot, not only are you trying to consider the the pads that you can take, right, but then you have to, you have another dimensionality of all the other pads and all the other information that that other robot could potentially see after um, it's gone out of way. And I guess in this case, I'm making the assumption that communication isn't happening. Um, but certainly you can you can do this up until the point you break communication. Yeah, that actually raises another question that I have, which is, are you choosing the optimal deployment places along a path that the say ground robot is taking um, and the ground robot has its trajectory planned already or does the ground robot go to wherever you've decided to deploy yes so um another strong assumption that i'm making is that the trajectory is kind of already fixed in place and uh, we are just making these decisions along the way so something that i really think um, would be a next natural stepping point is to kind of synergize the path planning with uh, a lot of what I'm developing because um, you can imagine that uh, when you've deployed at one location that should and definitely does influence where you go next. Um, one obvious case is that you want to go kind of opposite direction of where you've just deployed for your drone because your drone's telling you, okay, I might go in this direction and I'm going to go in the opposite direction because you don't want to um, both examine the same area. Uh, this is, of course, under the exploration um, context, I'm sure, you know, when you have a different problem definition, then you can optimize over that. Right. Yeah. Can you walk us through sort of the methodology for how you actually are making a decision? This kind of started with, uh, so the problem that the po my advisor and postdoc kind of posed to me was, uh, okay, we have these drones to deploy. Um, how do we make this happen? And I, I brought to the table uh, optimal stopping uh, theory. Uh, that was a little bit of a math hobby thing that I kind of knew about. And we did a lot more digging into that. And essentially, um, there were some very clever people uh, in the 70s and 80s that uh, came up with a problem formulation called uh, the sequential stochastic assignment problem. And it involves uh, having a certain number of agents and a cer certain number of jobs in their case. And you're trying to make assignments for each of these agents to these jobs as they come to you sequentially. And of course, these values are according to some kind of distribution. And so that's essentially what I'm employing here, where we have uh, the assumption that we know there's a certain amount of deployment locations along our mission space. So let's say there's 50 locations that we want to make these deployments. And when I know the distribution of the features of interest in this environment, I can uh, reason over that and come up with a set of thresholds that informs the deployment at each location. And what it essentially is doing is it's saying, okay, the value I see here at this deployment location, is it better than the future expected amounts of reward that I can get? And so um, all of that is kind of collapsed into a set of thresholds. And so that kind of makes the uh, deployment decision at each of the locations. And then, of course, the, the optimal policy for that is to um, take your uh, assignment if it's above a certain value of the threshold. Do you think that you could use this sort of um, this sort of assignment algorithm for, I guess, for other open problems? Um, but in particular, could you use it to decide as well when the robots return, if they were to return, or when they make other decisions? Could you apply this to like lots of open problems in robotics? Yeah, um, I think 
so so my quick gut answer is yes uh the the trick becomes kind of how you formulate um your assumptions and the distribution that you're thinking about so actually one of the other projects that um I'm, that i'm currently a part of uh with apl up at university of washington we're working on um having uh this underwater U um, auv rover um, inspect uh, energy turbines uh, using sonar. And then the question for us became, okay, could we employ this algorithm somehow um, to select special viewpoints along the way for us to stop and kind of scan because, you know, your scanning involves uh, as you're traveling. So as you're traveling, those can all be decision points. And then um, you can select decision locations where you want to stop and, and scan the the object uh, for your best reconstruction. Um, and so in that particular example, you're trying to reason over, okay, what is my feature space distribution? Um, and that, that's a big component of my algorithm in this case. So I think this has broad applications, but a lot of the difficulties is how you organize your prior knowledge and the information you're injecting into. Um, in another case, uh, actually for my journal paper, I'm trying to look at another use case where we're talking about um, deploying uh, these robots in a marine environment. So you have um, hot spots, I guess, biological hotspots in uh, marine data that you're interested in and to collect. And so the question becomes, how do you go through this environment and, and, you know, collect this information if you only have three or four pods or whatever to collect. And in that case, I'm trying to reason over the, uh, it's called ROMS data, but it's the marine data essentially. And the way I have to formulate it is in a little different way than uh, this urban uh, environment problem, because I'm not dealing with frontier cells. In this case, I'm, I'm kind of dealing with a, a distribution um, of the uh, temperature information or pressure information or whatever have you. Um, it sounds like there are a lot of potential applications. Um, I'm curious to hear sort of where you think this research will take you personally. Like what, which of these applications are you most drawn to? Um, and do you have any like sort of big plans for future work in the, in the more broad sense? Um, well, I am actually planning to graduate with my master's uh, in September. So uh, as far as the academia side goes, um, I don't think beyond the, the journal paper, I, I think I've, I've set it to a point where it's, you know, I'm sure there's plenty more research to be done. Um, because I think in this area, it's, it's fairly uh, blue sea. Uh, worthy and um you know when when in in terms of robotics when you run out of uh research to do in one robot just just go bigger right with like more robots so um in this case uh, i i think that that's where i'm gonna leave it um if i'm gonna bring this into my uh career i think that would be fairly interesting uh a lot of these open problems that i've talked about with you before uh certainly needs to be answered uh, for talking about a practical system. And actually, this is a great kind of full circle into the hardware side of things, right? And, uh, you know, so if I'm not going to pursue this in academia, how can I pursue this in industry? Um, we're talking about making uh, physical systems actually move and do, do things. Um, that's already hard enough with one, right? So again, uh, coupling two robots, and, and we've done it in this uh, sub T um, challenge, but the, the main challenge, in my opinion, there is that uh, we have the operator actually make the decision to deploy, right? Um, and because we're still very untrusting of algorithms in that sense, and I, it's for, for great reason. Right, um, and there's just a lot of other issues to to address there before we try and automate this one thing. So, I think if I were able to come back to this kind of problem domain uh, in the future, it would it would take a while because I do believe the hardware needs to take 
time to catch up or the adoption and necessity of the applications would would need to be there, right? Because um, you can imagine where a lot of applications that are already gaining traction for robotic use, like um, this one example is like wildfire, you know, tackling with... Um, with drones or nuclear repository um, inspection, all these things with robotics, it's already having a hard enough time getting traction um, there with one robot. And then if you're going to add in the complexities of a multi-robot system, uh, that's that's certainly going to take time. So I think for now, um, if for my immediate future, I think this is where I'll kind of put this on pause, but I think it's, it's a fairly interesting problem, especially with the, the path planning integration side. So who knows what the future will hold? Yeah. Uh, one thing that you mentioned is that that sort of adoption of switching over to automating things, which a person could do. Um, do you think that that is, is going to stifle this sort of research from being used in implementation? I think that that's a general, like, I think I'm not I'm not worried about my problem being like stifled because there are so many other issues that come way before that. Uh, especially, you know, we're talking about adoption of robotics in general, right? Like that kind of uh, explainability in AI, um, explainability in robotic decision making. All of this comes way before. Um, if someone's going to be worried about, you know, the, the robot being deployed at the wrong time uh, automatically versus uh, manually. But I do think uh, let's let's fast forward to, to the, the place, you know, in the future and let's say, OK, now we we have capable robots and, um, you know, now we're arguing, OK, should a human make this decision versus not? Um, I would say that, like we can still see this kind of uh, uh, semi-autonomous uh, fashion, um, not fashion, a semi-autonomous uh, policy in place. And this was kind of uh, described uh, for our uh, sub that we, we want to propose it was that this algorithm could just interject when it finds good locations or ideal deployment locations according uh, to decision making and and give that over to the uh, operator and say, okay, hey, I, I think you should deploy here, right? And that potentially takes a lot of the burden off of the operator because then they can kind of lean on that. And if they find other things are going on as they're controlling the robot or whatever's happening in the problem space, then they don't have to think about, oh, I, I need to think about deploying, right? Um, and so eventually you can have that semi-autonomous be the the bridge between you know uh, the manual version to the to the fully automated version because uh, that can build some kind of trust between the the human and the system um, and then of course if you have the case where the system needs to go fully autonomous because communication can't happen then um, you know that algorithm's there to, to take over and just go once it realizes communication is cut off yeah. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, very clear answer. Um, I think that's most of all the time that we have. Um, thanks so much for joining me today. It was definitely a, a, a pleasure talking with you. And that's it for today. As always, check out robohop.org forward slash podcast for more episodes. And while you're there, why not also take a look at our Patreon campaign? As the Robohop podcast is entirely run by volunteers who give their time and expertise freely the support we get from our listeners through Patreon is invaluable to ensure that we can keep going. So if you enjoy our content, check out how you could support us at robohop.org forward slash podcast. We'll be back in two weeks time. Until then, goodbye. Marsupial Robots with Robohub, the podcast for news and views on robotics. <laughs>